Under the tool shed behind Franklin and Irene's house in the suburbs lies a mysterious contraption that transports them to an unfamiliar world. For decades, they've come to the other side hundreds of times but are yet to discover its purpose and why they were chosen to find it. Now in their 70s, they wonder if they'll ever find the answers they're looking for. Until fate brings them an unexpected guest that just might be who they're waiting for. Several decades ago, at a packed bar, best friends Irene and Lee are bored as they sit at their table. By the pool table, two young men wait for Franklin before they continue their game. Franklin is by the jukebox, picking an Elvis song. He joins his friends and readies his pool cue. He catches Irene's eyes from across the room and they share a smile. He hits the cue ball with just the right amount of force in Irene's direction and the ball flies off the pool table and rolls right under her shoe. Seconds later, Franklin approaches Irene and they strike up a flirty conversation, staring intently into each other's eyes as the Elvis song plays in the background. In the present, Franklin and Irene, now an old married couple, are at the dining table. She tells him to go easy on the salt and he asks her why she's barely eaten anything. Later that night, Irene asks Franklin if he wants to look at the stars again. Outside the house, Franklin pushes Irene's wheelchair to the tool shed. Inside the tool shed, Franklin pushes aside a table to open the cellar door underneath it. He goes down the stairs first and holds Irene's hands to support her. In the cellar, the couple walks down a narrow hallway with a heavy stone sliding door that Franklin opens. They enter a capsule and stand in the middle as the door closes on its own. Irene hands Franklin a covered bowl and he holds it in his left hand. The couple stares at the stellar corona-like ceiling as everything becomes hazy and Franklin feels dizzy. A bright flash of light fills the room. And when Franklin opens his eyes, they've arrived. He takes the lid off the bowl and throws up inside it. Moments later, the door slides open and they walk into a futuristic room with a large glass view deck window. The couple hold hands and admire the nearby moons and stars above a desolate landscape of an unknown planet. After a few minutes of silence, Silence, they look at each other and exchange I love yous. Later, Franklin asks Irene why she's wanted to go there more lately, especially after her fall, and asks if she hasn't grown tired of it, because he has. She says she'll never grow tired of it and still wonders what's outside the door. Franklin reminds her of the mice he let out of the door that didn't survive more than a minute. He thinks the trips have taken a toll on their bodies and it's time they told somebody else about the portal, suggesting to tell Denise, their granddaughter. She disagrees and believes they were chosen to find it and it's their riddle to solve. While the couple makes their way back to the house, their nosy neighbor Byron spots them while walking his dog. That night, Franklin sleeps on their late son Michael's bed, while Irene sleeps in their upstairs bedroom. Franklin sees Michael's name etched into the wooden bed frame. The next morning, the couple drives to town, but stops for a minute to talk to Byron, who's mowing their side of the lawn. Franklin is annoyed, but Irene tells him not to make a big deal out of it. Byron asks if he can borrow Franklin's planer, but Franklin says it's broken. In Byron's house, he tells his wife, Janine, that Franklin was lying about the planer because he saw freshly planed wood by their house recently. He thinks the couple is hiding something in the shed, but Janine tells him to leave them alone because she's already sent Denise a message regarding what Byron saw. At the doctor's office, Irene's doctor, Sandra, tells Irene she's concerned she's still in her wheelchair a year after the fall. Irene insists she's fine, but Sandra says she's much too young to be in her current condition and wants to run more tests and increase the dosages on her medications. Irene's mind drips away, and she imagines the stellar corona ceiling of the capsule. She snaps back to reality when Sandra asks if she's considered in-home care. Irene says Franklin can take care of her, but the doctor thinks Franklin can't keep doing it for long. Later that day, Franklin meets Denise at the diner. At the doctor's office, Irene's checkup is done, but Franklin doesn't answer her call. At the diner, Denise tells Franklin that the neighbors are saying he pushes Irene in a wheelchair at night. She thinks it's time they move out of the house, especially after Irene's fall. Franklin understands his granddaughter's concern, but politely tells her he'd like to stay in their house until the end of his life. Meanwhile, Irene goes to the nursing home across the street where she sees Chandra, an old student of hers back when she was an English teacher. Chandra takes her to see her friend Sadie, whose husband had just passed away. Inside Sadie's room, the two women reminisce about working together at Sadie's bridal shop, but the fleeting moments are interrupted by Sadie's faulty memory. Irene tells her she's been traveling to a world light years away from where they are, which makes her the most special person Sadie has ever known. Irene cries as she explains her fear and doubts if she really is special because of her illness. 
At the house, Franklin brings in the groceries and calls out his wife's name. As he places the paper bags on the counter, he realizes his mistake and drives back to town to pick her up. In the car ride home, Franklin tells him about Denise wanting them to move out of the house. Abruptly, their car runs out of gas because he forgot to fill it up in town. Later, while Franklin talks to the roadside assistant, Irene stares up at the night sky and wonders what it wants from her. That night, Byron takes his dog out for a walk and lets his curiosity take him over to Franklin and Irene's tool shed. He snoops around and is startled when he receives a message and drops his phone in a bucket full of old light bulbs. Inside the house, Franklin tells Irene that he has thought about moving out of the house because something about the other sky scares him. Despite the fear, he still doesn't want to move out because he knows Irene doesn't want to, and she thanks him. Seconds later, Irene asks Franklin what he plans to do after she passes away. Franklin says he'd probably prefer passing away too, but Irene wants to have a serious conversation. She wants him to promise to sell the house if she ever goes first, and feels that they've kept the secret to themselves long enough. He promises to fulfill her wishes, but only if she promises not to think about passing away until they've both reached 100 years old. Later that night, Franklin massages Irene's feet on the couch and they talk about a fun memory of their son. He says that he likes hearing her talk about Michael. In bed, Franklin sings Irene the Elvis song he played on the jukebox the night they first met. He falls asleep, and Irene kisses him on the forehead before getting up and heading downstairs. Downstairs, Irene writes Franklin a letter where she tells him that she's waited long enough and wishes to make her own choice while she still can. She quotes a poem from Auden and tells Franklin to tell Denise how proud she is of her and she'll give his love to Michael. She walks around the house, looking at the little things that remind her of their son. Irene then makes her way to the cellar and enters the capsule. Inside the futuristic room, she places the letter on the table and heads to the door. She opens the first door leading to the hatch. As she is about to slide the main door open, she hears a gasp behind her. On the floor is a young man, asking her to help him. Irene is scared and confused about where this man could have possibly come from, and she asks him who he is. The next morning, Franklin hears Irene calling for him from outside, and he sees her trying to get up from the ground. Outside the house, Franklin helps Irene up and she tells him there's a man inside the shed. Down in the cellar, Franklin sees the man crawling on the ground and he helps him up the stairs. Later, they take the man to Michael's old bedroom and place him on the bed. They see blood on the man's clothes and body but can't seem to find any wounds. In the kitchen, Franklin grabs a roll of paper towels to clean the man up. But before returning to the room, he looks at the telephone. Back in the room, Franklin says the man might be a junkie who found his way in the shed. But Irene insists that he came from the other side. They hear the doorbell, and Irene tells her husband not to answer it. But Franklin says he called the police and told them he saw a man outside. At the door, Franklin tells the police chief, Thomas, that the man was gone and that they're alright. But Thomas says he'd better check inside the house just to be sure. Thomas looks around the house, and Irene asks to talk to him in private. And she says Franklin must have called the police because he's been confused lately. She apologizes for wasting the police officer's time and Thomas leaves. In Argentina, Stella wakes her daughter, Tony, up so they can start working on their farm chores. Later, they go to the chapel for their morning prayers before Stella takes Tony to school. In school, Tony is on a bench drawing, and Mattia sits beside and talks to her. That night, Tony sneaks out of the house and meets Matias just outside her family's compound. Matias is fascinated by the compound where Tony's family has lived for generations. He sees the chapel and opens the doors despite Tony telling him they need to leave. Inside the chapel, Tony kisses Matias, but he admits that he was only dared to get inside the haunted house by his friends. He's heard the stories about her grandfather's cult meeting in the chapel. Tony is heartbroken for thinking that Matias actually liked her, so he suggests they split the money he gets from doing the dare. Suddenly, Stella barges into the chapel and tells Matias to leave and for Tony to go to her room. The teenage girl tells her mother that she's ruining her life before going back to the house. Inside the chapel, Stella takes a lantern and opens a secret door on the wall leading to a cellar. She walks through a tunnel and opens the sliding door to a capsule where she opens a small compartment containing a yellow glowing object. Back in Franklin and Irene's house, the couple sift through the man's backpack and find a copy of The Count of Monte Cristo, a small brown pouch containing a rectangular rock and a handful of gold coins. Suddenly, the couple hear a noise coming from Michael's room and find the man on the floor. Franklin helps him back up on the bed, and Irene notes that he has a fever. She asks her husband to go to the pharmacy to get him the same flu medicine she was prescribed when she had similar symptoms before. At the pharmacy, Byron asks for people's signatures to start his campaign for town council. He sees Franklin arrive and asks for a signature, but Franklin waves him off with more important things on his mind. Franklin asks the pharmacist for the flu medicine and hands him the box. 
The pharmacist sees Dr. Sandra's name and number on the box and gives her a call. The pharmacist hands the phone over to Franklin because the doctor would like to speak to him, and Franklin receives surprising news from her. Back at the house, inside the book from the man's backpack, Irene finds a Polaroid picture of the man holding a baby, with the name Gabriel written on it. She hears the man cuffing and proceeds to make him some homemade tea. In the room, Irene makes the man drink tea to make him feel better. She then reads the Count of Monte Cristo to him. In Argentina, Stella visits the chapel for her morning prayers, then goes back to the house to wake Tony up, but her daughter isn't in her room. Later, Stella finds Tony walking down the dirt road and convinces her to get inside the truck. At a local coffee shop, Tony says she's tired of having no friends and living in their house in the middle of nowhere. Stella wants her to understand that she made a promise to her ancestors that she'd never leave their home and someday she'll tell Tony all about it. She adds that their family has a purpose to protect something special because it's God's will. Stella's phone suddenly buzzes with an alert, and she and Tony leave the coffee shop in a hurry. Inside the church, the alarms are going off and a video camera on a tripod is pointed at the open door of the empty capsule. Back in Michael's room, the man is feeling better and sits up in surprise when he sees Irene. He asks her where he is, and Irene says that he's in her home and that he's safe. She asks him what his name is, and he says his name is Jude. He doesn't remember where he's from or how he got there. Later, Franklin arrives and sees Irene and Jude talking in the room. When Irene stands up to greet him, she starts to feel dizzy, so Franklin takes her to the kitchen to get something to eat. At Byron's house, Janine recounts seeing a police car out outside Franklin and Irene's house earlier, and heard that they saw a prowler. She asks Byron if maybe he was snooping around again, and the old couple mistook him for someone else, but Byron assures her that it wasn't him. In the city, Denise has dinner with Cliff, a classmate from her MBA classes, and she tells him she worries about her grandparents sometimes. He asks why her father isn't taking care of her grandparents, and Denise makes up a story about her father instead of telling him the truth of his passing. That evening, Franklin expresses his concern for the repercussions of keeping Jude in their house and wants to get rid of him as soon as possible. When Irene argues, he tells her about his conversation with a doctor earlier and asks why she never said anything. Irene didn't want him to worry, but now she'll do everything her doctor tells her to if he allows Jude to stay for a while. This is because she believes he is who they've been waiting for. In Argentina, Stella and Tony arrive at their house. Stella grabs a pistol from the glove compartment and tells her daughter to stay in the truck. The front door of their house is open, and she sees Cornelius sitting at the dining table. Tony follows her mother into the house and asks who the man is. Is. Cornelius tells Stella to join him at the table and says he's glad she still has a gun because she'll be needing it. In Michael's room, Irene tells Jude to take one last dose of the flu medicine then says goodnight. Then, Franklin stays behind to have a chat with their visitor. After Irene leaves, Franklin asks Jude about the blood on his body, but Jude doesn't remember whose it is. A few seconds later, Franklin tells Jude that he doesn't trust him, but will allow him to stay in their house because Irene thinks he's special. If Jude does anything that puts Irene in danger, Franklin says he will regret it. When Franklin closes and locks the door, Jude spits the medicine out and hides it. In the city, Denise admits that she lied about her father to Cliff. She tells him that he ended his life when she was five years old and has a hard time talking about it. Cliff apologizes for asking about him, but Denise thinks it's best that they call it a night. Decades ago, Franklin and Irene were a young couple in their new house. Irene tells Franklin that she's pregnant and he lifts her up in joy. In the present, Jude gets up in the middle of the night and takes Irene's letter for Franklin from his pocket. He uses a fork to open the door lock and wanders around the house. He takes a knife from the kitchen drawer and thinks about going upstairs, but proceeds to the bathroom instead. Inside the bathroom, he rolls up his pajamas and uses the knife to cut into his left leg to remove a tracking device. He wraps up his wound with a towel then crushes the tracking device on the sink. He pulls a hair-thin wire inside the device before throwing the debris down the drain. Outside the house, Jude makes his way toward the tool shed. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications and leave a like it really helps the channel out. Thank you for watching.